All right, everyone. Welcome back to Tammy Datathon 2023 Help Videos. My name is Eric Nunez, and today's video we'll be talking about pandas. So if you haven't watched the video on NumPy, I would recommend checking that out first, since it's a lot of NumPy and pandas discussion, a lot of it goes hand in hand. And, and so with pandas, now is going to be where you'll actually be able to manipulate some data files, as well as being able to actually see some graphs for the first time based on some imported data and overall i do think that pandas is a little bit cooler than numpy but you know both of them have admirable qualities and and yeah so very excited for today's video and so let's go ahead and get started uh make sure that whenever you're whenever you want to call uh, pandas you have it imported uh and then you want to import that as import pandas as pd again it's tradition for uh, for data scientists and people within the field to be able to frequently use PD rather than calling pandas dot whatever function they want to do. And so let's go ahead and go into pandas over here. And so pandas like uh, is a Python library that's primarily used for data manipulation and analysis. So the name comes from panel data. So panel data, yeah, at panda. And panel data is just uh, is a statistical term used to measure multi-dimensional data frames over long periods of time. And so pandas is a really great tool for cleaning a data set, calculating the statistics of a data set, finding the correlation between values, as well as plotting values of the data frame. And so first, let's go ahead and talk about the difference between a series and a data frame. So these two um, are going to be very important terms within within pandas, particularly data frames. And so a series within a pandas is a one dimensional array, most often a NumPy array, that will hold information about a particular subject. Um, and then it's important to note that in pandas, the one dimensional array containing data is regarding a single column and not information on a single row. And that's because the, the columns are what's actually most important to us. Uh, so the rows will store indices, also known as data points or just individual data entries. Whereas the columns, they will actually hold the key ingredients and like the necessary information for, for like the, ver the variables. So in this case, for example, we have apples and oranges. Uh, another example of a column could be uh, total sales. It could be for example, if we were talking about a housing data set, it could also be like number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, whereas the rows would correspond to like home A, home B, home C, so on and so forth. All of them with like, uh, all of them with like their own number of bedrooms and number of bathrooms and whatever values we decide to, to throw in. And then a data frame is pretty much a two dimensional array that's like an amalgamation of series. Uh, it pretty much acts like a table with rows and columns, as we see with the columns as well as the rows over here. Uh, you can imagine data frames as a collection of series, like I said, and yeah. And we have this little schematic over here where we have one series which represents apples, and then we have another series that also represents, I mean, that represents oranges. And then when we add them together, uh, we get a data frame. Uh, really, these two... This process would be called concatenation. Uh, there's just the addition symbol, but yeah, we would con concatenate these two and they would become a data frame. Um, and yeah, so now's, get, now's actually the cool stuff. Um, here is where we're gonna actually be able to import our data. So the cool thing is we can actually import data in a wide variety of sources. Um, if you have a file, you can import that via, it can be a, a CSV file, a TXT, or a JSON. So CSV, for those that don't know, stands for comma separated values. So if you actually open up a, a sample value is that, if you open up a CSV, you can actually open it up in a notepad or notepad plus plus, or just a text editor. And you'll actually see that all the values are separated by commas and each comma, um, yeah, so like each comma is like designating like which 
column it's gonna be in and it's like separating those and each row corresponds to each data points within the, within the, the data set. So that's pretty cool. Um, so let's go ahead and read in purchases.csv. And so in this case, we see that we get over here, uh, we have this one column called unnamed, uh, and then we have like June, Robert, Lily, David, and then we have apples and oranges. And so it looks okay, but here's the thing. Um, I'm not really the biggest fan of having this unnamed column over here, especially when these two are at least like more properly named. And so if your first column is the index column, which in this case it is, uh, we can actually specify that as a parameter within read CSV. And we can say that our index column is equal to zero. Uh, most often it's this value is like null. So that's why, and so that's why we actually create our own indices over here. So if you see this zero, one, two, and three, um, not only is that uh, an instance of zero based indexing, like I mentioned in the last video, but this is our index, at least for this data frame. But if you wanna make these values, like the names themselves, the our indices, then we can do that by saying index underscore column is equal to zero. And now we have June, Robert, Lily, and David, all of them are their own unique indices for this particular data frame. So that, so that works really well. Uh, you can do the same thing for a text file. Um, it works in a similar manner. Um, you might think, oh, um, if I import via text file, will it look this differently? But realistically, that's just because previously, like we have, uh, we're, we're calling print rather than just displaying it. If I were to go ahead and change this to display, then it would display, uh, display pretty nicely. Um, but do notice that when we are reading in a text file, um, we still use the read CSV command. So like, yeah, we use like, we use read CSV for CSVs, that makes sense. But would it make more sense to have a, a command called read underscore TXT? But like I said, uh, CSV files, they're pretty much just glorified text files. If you open them up in a text editor, you'll see that they're all just separated by commas. And if you have a text file, it's really no different. And, and so that's why we still prefer having the read CSV. Um, Note that there are many different parameters associated with read CSV, as well as many of the other functions that we'll cover today. Um, for the sake of time, I won't be covering all of them, and also because many of them aren't relevant to, to what you want. But I will point out that if you have a text file and it's not separated by commas, so like for example, if it's separated by tabs, then that could also be a pretty good, then I'm pretty sure you could also call a, you could also call a parameter on here called delimiter. And so what delimiter does is that it pretty much separates or like it extracts all the values based on like what's separating the values. So under read CSV by default, it's a comma, but you can change that to, I don't know, it can be tab, it can be double dash or whatever the hell you, you wanna do. And then you can import a JSON file. Uh, this time we actually do change the command. So it's read underscore JSON. Cool. And just for the sake of it, you can actually create your own data frames um, by, by doing a similar format like this. And you'll notice that if we take a look at this, this is, fair, this is fairly kind of like formatting under a, a CSV. I mean, sorry, a JSON, JSON. And the reason that is, is because we're using all these uh, squiggly brackets and we have and then we have a key followed by a value and the value in this case is just a nested JSON and so you see that we have a key for June and then a value of three uh, a key for Robert and then a value of two so on and so forth and so this right here is just an example of just creating a data frame based kind of similarly to read JSON so if you want to create your own data frames, uh, this is certainly a technique that you can use. All right, so we read in some of the data. Uh, let's go ahead and use a more famous example. So let's go ahead and read in something called the Titanic training data set. So 
What this is, is that this is a data set comprised of a bunch of passengers who, who were embarked on the Titanic, and we determine whether they survived or not based on a bunch of different attributes. A uh, quick minor note with, uh, with this, I would advise that if you do that for, I would advise that for many of these basic uh, training data sets that are most often used. So like, for example, Titanic, Iris, MNIST, which is a handwriting recognition. I would advise against putting those on a resume since they are more so used as good examples of like, of they're used as good examples for showing off techniques of data science and machine learning and not as individual standalone projects. It's like putting in a homework for, for like a introduction to to C++ class as a, as a project on your resume. It's like, it, it, it's, it's not really ideal. You probably want to like be able to create projects of your own or otherwise have like projects from like other sources. But that side note aside, if we want to actually read in the data, we can read in the data or we can check the data to see if we have it read in correctly by having head and tail. So these two functions, they're very similar, but they are a little bit opposite. So head, it'll return the first few rows within a given data frame, and tail returns the last few rows within a given data frame. Note that this X is not required. If you don't specify it, then by default, it'll return the first five or the last five. So if we can read in this data over here, we see that we have a passenger, we read in the, the first three of the passengers over here. And so we see that, for example, we have a, a Mr. Owen Harris and and all these different values over here. And this is the, the start of the, the CSV file. Whereas if we call tail, these are the last five within that you see within our CSV file. We can gather general information about each column by calling info. So for example, we have 891 entries in here. We can actually see how many values in here are not null. So in this case, passenger ID, survived, P class, all these are have like 891 non-null values. So this indicates to us that for many of these columns, um, all of them are filled in and they are not null, meaning that we don't have to worry about null values for those columns. That being said, there's still two columns in particular, uh, age and cabin, where they are null and, and we do want to be careful with them. And lastly, uh, we see that it reads in, uh, checks the data type as well. So like, for example, we have, uh, we have integers, floats, and objects. Objects are most frequently cast for stuff that generally would fall under the umbrella of string or otherwise another class. It's something that the, that pandas has a bit harder time reading in. And so here we see that we have all these values and we'll talk a little bit more about how to tackle the, these values in which they, there are null values. But for now, um, let's go ahead and see just a quick bit of information as to like what each value stands for. So we have the variables, the definitions, and the keys. Um, if you want to take a look at this, feel free to pause, but we have a lot of stuff to cover, so we'll move on. Um, so we have a bunch of null values, and, and we'll talk about like how to extract that in a bit. And finally, if you want to be able to extract uh, particular values, um, then you can either use lock, iLock, or you can use uh, more direct indexing like this. If you want to get a specific column, then what you can do is you can get the, you can just directly call its name. Uh, if you want multiple, you can actually do, you can actually create like a little inner array. And so for example, so we say like, for example, if we want to get survived and we want to get age. Uh, then we would get, then it would be something like that. And see, we have survived and age. We'll change it back to survived. Oopa. There we go. Okay. And, and so we have lock and I lock. Um, but the primary difference between these two, you might think they're very interchangeable, but the thing is, um, lock is based specifically on the name whereas iLock is based on numerical index. So, and so in this case, even though we have lock of one over here, 
Uh, the reason that is the case is because if we go ahead and display our data frame, you'll notice that our indices is now equal to the passenger ID. So we set the passenger ID column to represent the, the index column as we see with this parameter over here. And so when we say df lock at one, then we're saying find me the value, like find me the index where the, uh, yeah, find me the index value where the index is exactly equal to one. So in this case, it matches up here. But then if we say I lock, say, okay, um, numerically speaking, get me the index for index zero. And because pandas is zero-based indexing, when we say index of zero, we really mean uh, the first row. So in this case, we, we get this right here. And yeah, um, ideally, it, it's not really the best, it, it's not really the best named. Um, personally speaking, uh, I'd rather not have passenger ID be the, the index column for this example, but, but for example, like if we were to try and change it to like, so zero, one, two, like let's say we change it to three and then what we can do is we can say df lock there we go and so now we actually change the name of the passenger to be the to be the index column and and now we can actually see that for example we have and so so now we can more clearly see the difference between lock and i lock so lock actually gets the the specific index value, whereas iLock is only focused numerically speaking. So it's really up to you how you decide to be able to, to get like your rows and columns. If you want to use lock, iLock, or if you want to use this. Generally speaking, I tend to prefer using this. I, I tend to prefer having it like naming the value specifically, the column specifically. But then for rows, I tend to prefer using iLock. But ultimately, it's up to you on how you choose to implement We'll change, go ahead and change this back. Perfect. Okay. Cleaning data. I promised we would actually clean the data, and now here we are. So, so let's go ahead and run this bit of code. And so, oopa. So, for example, uh, one way to be able to approach data that is null is to be able to just remove it from our data set. So, in this case, for example, uh, we take our age. Um, and then any person within the Titanic data set that, is, that has a null value for, for age, we remove them. Um, and then we just keep the ones where the values are not null, also known as not NA. And so in this case, if we take info, now we see that the number of entries has been reduced down to 714. Remember, it was previously at 891. But then we still have cabin over here. Uh, if we want to remove like all rows where there's any null data, period, then we can also call this. I believe this also drops all the the null, uh, any row that has null values in it, even if it's for just one column. And then now we see that we have, what is that, 183 entries and 183 non-null values for all of these. But there's a big, big problem. Removing rows just pretty much means that you're removing very valuable data. Like, is it really worth, like if you're in a big data set with like hundreds of columns and any and, and one, just one column is null, is it really worth removing that entire row? Or do you, would it be better off if you find different ways? Um, and so one alternative way is that you can, is that for all the null values, you can actually substitute and fill in based on the different values. So for example, uh, we can put in mean, median, or mode. Most frequently we wanna put in either mean or median. And, and so what'll end up happening now is that for any value that is null for age at least, we will actually go ahead and by default put in the average age for all these people. So the age on the actual CSV file, it is, it is an integers. So it's like, for example, like we have 22, 38, 26, but then when we take the mean, we actually end up getting a, a non integer value. We get a float. And so in this case, so for example, uh, 
Miss Catherine uh, Carey over here, uh, her age was not specified in the original file, so we just gave her a placeholder value of 29.699, which again is the average. Uh, not to say that this is the most, uh, that this is not the best technique, but it is better than just removing entire rows. And so like now at least we're working with full 891 rows rather than, you know, uh, trying to finesse it with 183. And so let's go ahead and see what we previously had. And yeah, uh, we can also go ahead and check if we have any values that are duplicated. And so, for example, we see we can check for any duplicated values. And if we do, uh, we can say drop duplicates. Within this case, we don't have any duplicate rows, so, so we're fine. Uh, duplicated just checks for duplicated rows. Uh, this is particularly useful if you have like a large, large data set, but very few columns. All right, finally, let's actually get into some analysis and plotting. So if we want to find the correlation between any two given columns, then we can call dot .corr on our data frame. And, and so over here, we see the, the general relationship between all these. And so this actually gets us the... And so, and so what this does is that this actually gets us the, the R value. I, I say we, I say I put in R squared. Um, this is actually wrong. This, this just gives us the, our correlation value. So let me just fix that really quickly. Uh, correlation coefficient. There we go. Okay. So this gets us our R value. But then if we square this, this will actually give us our coefficient of determination, also known as R squared. And that's also the reason why you'll actually see some of these values be negative. And that's because the, the correlation coefficient, it doesn't, uh, when something is negative, it doesn't say that, oh, the, this is like a bad, you shouldn't, you, like we shouldn't be comparing, for example, fair with, like we shouldn't be comparing fair with a P class. In reality, this just signifies that we have a negative correlation, uh, meaning that like as fare increases, uh, P class uh, decreases on average. Uh, and I mean, it would make sense because like, for example, uh, fare, one represents first class, second represents second, third represents third, and then P class, uh, I mean, sorry, that, that represents P class. P class uh, one represents first, the second is second class, so on and so forth. And then the fare for first class is obviously going to be way higher than that of, for example, third class. And so that is something that is worth, uh, worth noting. And then similarly, if we have positive values, that means that they are positively correlated. And you'll notice that we have these perfect like 1.0s down the diagonal. And that's just because we're comparing one variable to itself. And so because it's a perfect match all around, then it's just going to say, oh, it's a perfect match, 1.0. And yeah. And so, so do note that when we have a coefficient of determination or R squared, R squared is generally a pretty, is like, it's generally a pretty fair metric of determining how correlated any two values might be. And, and so if we were to go ahead and square all these values, we can see that, for example, um, so like if we were to square this, this would end up with a value of about uh, an R squared of about 0 0.25, which in the grand scheme of things, isn't really that correlated. The best R squared values tend to be about 0 0.7 or above. Uh, generally speaking, we try and aim for about like 0 0.85 or 0 0.9 or higher. And yeah, and so one last thing, let's go ahead and actually do some Plotting. So let's go ahead and, for example, let's see what would happen if we plot everything. As we can see, it's a mess. But then again, that's also because we didn't really specify what we wanted to do with our data. So like we see that passenger ID increases as the index goes up. It's like, no, duh. Um, the fare, we can see that the fare spikes up when, most likely when it's like a first, pass, a first class passenger who's paying. And so that's pretty cool. Um, so let's go ahead and like try and like make some sense out of this mess. 
let's go ahead and like reduce our Titanic data set just to age and parts. So in this case, it doesn't really it doesn't really do that much, but we can at least see like that all the general variations between age. Note that this doesn't really signify anything. This is just showing off the, uh, this is just like essentially saying that like, oh, uh, the passenger at index, what is that? Like index 610-ish was probably like what? Four years old, whereas the one is like, that's like 615, they were probably like 80 years old, so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah. We're not limited to just line graphs either. We can create scatter plots. So like, for example, let's compare age versus fare. And so we generally see that most people tend to be congregated around like less than 100. These people who are a little bit more, they're probably first and second class. And then these two over here, uh, I'm assuming that they that they like got like top of the top for first class and and yeah. We can also create histograms if we like. Uh, this basically just shows the frequency between all these values. So we're getting the frequency of all the ages. So naturally there's like less older passengers on the Titanic and there's more uh, middle-aged, younger passengers on the Titanic. So like a bunch of like 20 and 30 year olds. And yeah. So overall, that's a pretty cool representation of our data set. Um, ideally we wanna use a more graph-oriented uh, libraries such as matplotlib or seaborn to be able to compute all this stuff, but we'll be talking more about those in our next lab. And, and so we'll talk more about visualization, pre-processing, and analysis in our next video. So, all right. Uh, thank you for watching and happy hacking.